They're not, not designed to go down into the ear canal and seal the ear canal well enough. And, and the fact that they're universal. Uh, you know, they, they have, you know, some rubber tips on them for sizing to get you, a, you know, a better seal. But it's not, it's still into that one size fits all fits nobody category that yep. you're getting close, but it's not enough for shooting. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 90 of For the Love of Guns. My name is Jason Scheller. It is my pleasure to welcome you back to Team Banch as we talk to Jack Coma from ESP or Electronic Shooters Protection. Now joining me today as a co-host is my good buddy, Robert Lupo from Lupo Outdoors. Now, I asked him to join me today because he has not one, but two sets of these things. And I just wanted, well, someone who actually used the product to join me on the podcast. Now, before we talk to Jack, it's time to pay the bills. And this episode is brought to you by Falco Holsters. Look, Falco Holsters are handmade leather holsters built to your specifications. And you get them in about 10 days. And these things are beautiful. I mean, you can get hand carved and look at the detail of that. Sorry for those of you on the audio side, but trust me, these things are amazing. They can build a holster for any gun, any budget, without sacrificing quality. Check out Falco Holsters and use the checkout code BANSHEE to save 10%. Now, this episode is also brought to you by Freedom Crew University. Now, I have gun building videos, and some of them have been taken down off of social media. And, well, I've even been lucky enough to be, well, targeted by Congress. Nothing I did was illegal, but they don't want you to have knowledge. Go check out Freedom Crew University and learn skills that'll just take your gun building to the next level. We've got the best instructors on the internet at Freedom Crew University. Go check it out. Now with the bills paid, let's talk to Jack. Jack, tell me about your love of guns. Yes, I'm uh, Jack Homa. I am the owner of Electronic Shooters Protection, otherwise known as ESP or ESP America, which is our website. i uh, been doing this now 28 years, and so we're just getting started at it. So what interested you into like creating a hearing protection company? I mean, you, we, we think about different companies, you know, being outdoors, all three of us are, are shooters. What led you to hearing protection? Well, that's kind of a roundabout story. The uh, electronic shooters protection actually existed. I purchased the company from the audiologist here in, uh, in Denver, Colorado, that created the um, pro whole product category. He was the first one to do a custom in the ear uh, electronic earplug. Uh, the only thing previous to that was the old Walker game ear that was the yeah. behind the ear with the little foam plug on the end. And he thought he could do a better job. And being an audiologist, he went in his back room and fashioned out uh, the first ESPs for, for his family and for himself. He was a shooter. Families were all shooters and hunters. And then people started asking for him uh, around his circle of friends. And uh, he, they decided to form a company out of it. Uh, but there was, because of his audiology practice and things like that, I uh, decided to uh, move on from it. And I was the lucky recipient to be able to pick it up. And yeah, so funny. my background was in the t telephone industry. And so the technology was not foreign to me to, as far as sound and sound processing and things like that. And so it was just a good opportunity to jump into. Awesome. It's funny because I've had a couple of companies on that were the same way. I, I asked that question. They're like, well, actually, it was found by somebody else that had a great idea, but that great idea, they just couldn't move it forward uh, because they have a regular job they got to do or or they came up with this great idea right when they're ready to retire and, and enjoy life. And yep. it's great to see people pick up these businesses and continue those legacies. Because otherwise, you can have this great product, and then it just goes away. Well, and, and at the time, when we first started out, it was an unknown entity as far as, what are, what are these fancy earplugs? Um, I, I mean, I like to tell the story is through the years, when we first started out, we were going out and selling the concept and the product and the idea of this earplug that you could put in and still be able to hear. 
Uh, and we did that all the time, going to all the shooting events and going to the Sporting Clays Nationals and the uh, Grand American and things like that. Uh, but over the years, as things progressed and uh, other competitors came out, that it was now a, more of a known product and it became why you versus the other guys or which model do I want? Those types of uh, things were started to happen. And now it's just, to a certain extent, taking orders. Uh, people know what electronic hearing protection is, whether it's muffs, our custom earplugs, or the universal fit earplugs that people have. Uh, so the, the concept is not uh, new to the world anymore. Well, it's funny because you, you talk about the universal fit. You know, a couple of years ago, I changed over from passive hearing protection to electronic hearing protection. And, um, you know, they're great, right? It's, it's great going from that passive to the electronic. The problem I have with a lot of these products that I use is they're universal. And for those of you on the audio side, I'm using air quotes. Um, they're universal. They don't quite fit right. Okay. You know, like I, they'll be fine for like the first few shots and stuff like that. Uh, especially if I'm shooting a rifle and I'm leaning up against a the stock, they'll eventually start working their way out of my ear. And um, that's where, you know, uh, Lupa over there, I uh, got, got my left and my right mixed up here. Um, you know, he was talking about when he ordered his and he, you know, he, he got talking about this and I'm just like, you know, that's, it reminds me of when I was a little kid, I used to have custom molded earplugs. Um, but of course, you know, I had those when I was like, 10 which i'm a little little taller now um from when i was 10 so that was the kind of the nice thing is you know it, it's nice to have a custom molded earplug that's electronic you know you kind of get that best of both worlds at that point so you don't have that earplug falling out while you're shooting yeah i mean it, it, the, the saying that we use is one size fits all that fits nobody uh <laughs> But funny, funny little story is many years ago when one of our competitors came out with the, their version of the universal fit, I was at one of the Hollywood celebrity shoots and I'm wearing, wearing my logo shirt and all that. And this lady comes running up to me on the course and says, oh, I love my new earplugs, but I lost one already because it fell out of her ear because it didn't fit. And ours don't fall out. Yeah. And that's um, that's actually happened to me at the range. Um, I've had I've had one pop out, and of course it it popped out at the most inopportune time when the gun was going bang, right? Of course. Um, and uh, it's like for me, I have hearing loss as it is. Uh, you know, you know I call it being a child growing up in the seventies and eighties. You know, the Walkman generation. Uh, we were blowing our eardrums out. You know, rock, rock and roll, hot rods and shooting. Yep. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, I started shooting when I was 10. You know, you, when you're a kid, sometimes you just don't want to put earplugs in. It's like, it's just a 22. And, and you have no idea the damage that you're doing just by doing that. Um, you know, suppressors weren't a thing back then. But, you know, tell me a little bit about a lot of, the, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about hearing protection. Uh, would you mind telling me some of the misconceptions of hearing protection that you hear? Um, I'm only firing one shot. What do I need it for? <laughs> the tip is, that's the, the deer under. Uh, yep. Or, or um, when I get ready to shoot, I'll put them in. Uh, doesn't happen. <laughs> you know, buck fever takes over. It's not going to happen. But, you know, the, the misconceptions of, there really is none. I mean, it's, you need hearing protection. Uh, doing without is going to cause damage. Um, so I was, I was just reading an article recently in one of the journals, the hearing journals, and they're talking about the quiet world and how the OSHA basically says, you know, 85 decibels is safe to live in uh, or 90, something like that. And they're proving that even that level of constant day-by-day -day street noise is damaging to the hearing. And so, you know, everything we do in our life has some effect on our body. I mean, whether it's, you know, not wearing sunglasses and getting UV problems, not wearing, you know, suntan lotion and having those, you know, those types of things. So 
all of the noise coming into our ears is constantly going to be uh, causing issues uh, with your hearing. So wearing it all the time, you know, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, um, it doesn't help you. Um, you know, I get asked all the time, well, what's the best hearing protection? The best is whatever you're going to use all of the time. Yep. And so um, that's where the electronics come in, and that's where our claim to fame is that because you can hear your surroundings while you're wearing your hearing protection, you tend to use them. But yeah. you know, if you're wearing the passive protection, well, I can't hear my dogs working. I can't hear the birds flushing. You know, I can't hear the deer crawling through the leaves. Um, and you're not going to use it. So that, that's really the misconceptions of, of hearing protection is you got to use it. Can I interject on that? Absolutely. Um, by the way, uh, I am... Uh, Dr. Robert Lupo, uh, I am uh, the website or YouTube channel Lupo Outdoors, and I am an active user of these ESP uh, hearing protections. Um, and he's spot on when it comes to the thing is, is whatever you're going to wear is and wear comfortably is what you're going to use all the time. And with me, uh, I do a lot of shotgun shooting. So I'm doing, you know, ski trap and sporting clays. And it was actually my instructor who turned me on to ESP. And I have muff ears, which is very common for most people. They use muffs. But it constantly gets in the way when I'm rapidly bringing up uh, my shotgun. Um, they get hot. They get sweaty. They're uncomfortable. I've used uh, other types of plug you know, um, uh, that I'm doing a, a full review on with the ESPs. And ESPs, they go, once they're inside, you almost forget that you're wearing them because the sound quality is so good that you just, they're, they're just there. Um, and until you pull the trigger, and then you know they're there because I can hear everything around me. I can hear the birds chirping, but I can't hear that gunshot. And, and that really is, is the biggest difference. Um, and the clarity, uh, especially of, their, of the uh, upper ends, the clarity is so precise. It, you know, it dampens wind noise, and it's just astounding. Um, like I said, once you have them in your ears, one, they will not fall out because they're molded to the inside of your ears. And, and it makes all the difference 100%. Like... All my other uh, ear protection are now gathering dust. See, and, and I like what you're talking about with the wind. Um, you know, I get a lot of these hearing protection, you know, the, these electronic hearing protections. And when I put up the videos on the YouTube channel of my hearing protection, the first question that hits is, what about wind? Right? And then some, there's you just deal with the whistling <clears throat> noise, right? Others, they have these little things you got to stick on the side that fall off, right? Little, little windscreens. Um, you know, Jack, talk a little bit about that with, you know, I mean, that's got to be a very tricky thing to do to filter out wind noise. I mean, uh, we'll, well talk into, into the suppression of the sound for the gunshots, but particularly the wind. How do you guys deal with that? Well, wind, wind comes in two flavors. Wind hitting the microphones of whatever device, whether it's plugs, muffs, universal fits you know if it's got a microphone when hitting the microphone you've i'm sure you've done outdoor podcasts with a you know with a mic when the wind blows it's going to rumble in that microphone uh for us one of our things we were the first ones to do it is we took and tucked the microphone up in that little flap of skin at the top front of your ear it's called the helix of the ear and by tucking the microphone in there that acts as a natural windbreak to keep the wind most of it off of the microphone simple as that Smart. You know, on the earmuffs, it's on the side of the, you know, the muff. Or one, of, one model, I forget who they are, but theirs are pointed forward. Um, the universal fits, almost all of them are on the outside. They have some kind of wind filter that goes with them, but it's only effective so much. Even with ours. I mean, if you're out in 50-mile-an-hour winds and you turn your head the wrong way and the wind cups in there, you're going to get some rumble. But the second part of wind is wind makes noise in the environment. Uh, whether it's just the roar of the wind, you know, coming across the plains or blowing through the trees, the grasses, the corn stalks, making that white noise type effect. That's where our new top of the line Apex model 
has a patented wind noise suppression management system uh, in there. And it virtually eliminates all that white noise. Uh, we have one customer that uh, in their fifth wheel trailer, uh, when he was watching TV with his older model, the Stealth model, uh, the furnace would come on. And the blower on the furnace would cause him to turn the TV up, driving his wife out of the trailer. Uh, <laughs> we, got him, we got him set up with the new Apex. He doesn't turn the volume up anymore. He doesn't hear the blower from the furnace. I mean, so that's, that's just that funny. white noise, that constant noise. It's kind of like your traditional noise cancellation headsets for, you know, flying. Uh, it gets rid of that, that steady background noise, but doesn't affect the hearing, you know, uh, the natural sounds. So uh, it's been extremely well received. Um, our uh, sales of those is now probably the most popular, definitely the most popular with repeat customers that have, had our product for 10, 20 years, coming back to get new ones, they're upgrading to the Apex. So that's, that's the difference in, in wind. So, uh, you know, it's kind of unavoidable uh, with electronic products uh, because there is a microphone out there that can get hit by wind. But we try to management, manage it as best as we can. Well, and then, you know, because the universal fits, um, like I said, you know, they have little stickers you can put on that are the, I mean, the microphone I have here for the podcast has a wind break on it, right? That right. Little, you know, we call it a dead cat, um, that breaks up that sound. And this is some of these universal fits. That's what they're doing is they're trying to filter that out. I love what you're talking about is you're using the anatomy of the body to try to, as a natural wind break, to try to break up the, the, right. the actual wind hitting the mic. And like you said, you know, sooner or later, you're going to get into a position, you know, wind has, you know, wind is going to hit it. But no, I don't think anyone's looking at, um, you know, like, like you were saying with that white noise, you know. Right. Because, I mean, it, let's face it, the universal fits, they're trying to hit a price point of, you know, between $80 and $200, right? Right. I mean, they're, it's, it's a consumer, it's a consumer product. Yep. Right. Whereas yours is more of a professional product. And, you know, that's where you kind of separate between the two products. You know, you have the consumer products, they're low end, but they're going to have problems. You want to pay a little more money, get the high end stuff. Then you start dealing with, um, you know, better quality, better, uh, you know, wind resistance, those type of things. Well, I mean, there, there's some of that comes into play from a, a manufacturing standpoint. Uh, I mean, the universal fits. The, the, the better ones are, you know, uh, do a better job of a lot of things as far as that goes. But you're also dealing with a couple of other factors is they're mass producing them. Uh, they, they can, you know, have, you know, a bunch of minions sitting along the production line assembling all these together. It's the same thing every time. Ours are all custom made. Every one of them is hand built. Um, so there's a little, you know, a few other factors in there that goes along with the custom nature of it. Um, but, uh, you know, in, and we, yeah, we, tr we try to be the, the, the better components and better sound quality. Um, you know, we're using hearing aid technology, uh, ad adapted for our purposes, but the, the qual level and quality we use, um, most of our products, you could double or triple the price if you bought them as a hearing aid, because they call it medical. And <laughs> yeah. It's the same, it's the same parts. That's, that's we, when, uh, you know, in, in boating, when I, used, when I used to be in boating, we used to jerk around saying that, um, you know, just a clip on the end of your rope. If you get it at the hardware store, it might be $3. You get it at the boating store, it's $15 because yep. it's a boat clip, right? Yep. Not a clip. It's the exact right. same product, yep. but it has boat on it, so it's worth more. Right, right. So, I mean, that's, that, that, you know, the technology and, you know, the, the way they build the circuits for the consumer products, if, as you call them, the universals, um, is, a, is a little different than what's built for hearing aid use. And the, the sound processing and the engineering that goes into that is a little higher level. Sure. Now, you're, you know, we're talking about these things being custom. Uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure that Lupo was on, because he's been through this process. I mean, this is not like I just go out and buy a thing of silly putty, stick it in my ear, and then send it to you, right? I mean, no, Lupo, tell no. me a little bit about how the fitting worked. Uh, the, the process was 
super easy. So uh, what I did is I went over to Sam's Club. Um, and this also works if you go over to um, uh, Costco as well. But uh, any place that does uh, fitting for hearing aids would be able to do a mold of your inner ear. Um, so I went over to the Sam's Club. Um, I went over to the hearing area. He sat me down right away and he started injecting. Uh, first of all, he inspected the ears to make sure that there wasn't like a buildup of wax. And then he did the uh, injecting and after a few, he pulled out the molds and, you know, you have your right and your left mold there and, um, and they're free. They didn't charge, they don't charge for that. Wow. So you're lucky. Uh, you're lucky. <laughs> really? Oh yeah. Go to New York city. It's a hundred dollars per ear plus. Wow. wow. Oh yeah. Wow. <laughs> so come to Florida and go to Sam's Club. <laughs> <laughs> or Costco, both Sam's Club and Costco, uh, in, in many places, it, uh, they don't charge you, which was, was nice. Um, if they do charge you, I would, I would shop around and find a place that's going to be either the cheapest or is not going to charge you because it, it was just literally a matter of five minutes to get both ears done. Um, and then I, once I had my molds, I mailed them in and, and in a very short period of time, mm -hmm. Uh, my hearing protection showed up and there is no, so, I mean, when you're dealing with other plugs, eventually you get, uh, they, they wear on the inside of your ears and, you yeah. know, they're stretching and they're tight. Um, and then like, th you know, some things you have to turn them and they, they go into the brackets in the front of the ears. That's fine for maybe 10 to 15 minutes of shooting. And then after that, your ears hurt and that's now distracting you from your shooting with with head you know with the earphones my ears are getting hot and 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 yep. uncomfortable and you got the pressure on your head distracting you from your shooting then when you're doing sporting clays i don't want any distractions i need to focus on my disc so with these they're so they're perfectly fitted to my ears they go right in and you can adjust the volume, you know, turn them on and adjust the volume, uh, putting in uh, batteries with nothing. It, you know, it's a very simple process. Um, you got to remember to take your batteries out when you're not using them. Um, but it, it's the only regret I have is I didn't do this sooner. I should have done this years ago and my hearing would be better off and it is today. Yeah. I wear them now when I go on my motorcycle. Oh, wow. That's cool. I, you know, it's funny. I didn't even think about that for you. Um, and, it, you know, because they also have uh, sound amp amplification to them as well. Right. So um, I can actually so you can hear. turn them down. You can tune it, yeah, you can tune, you can tune to what you need. Um, now, Jack, once you, once, you know, like Lupo sent you his molds, what happens on your side? Um, well, it goes into the lab, and they take that mold, uh, they carve it up to, uh, and we've got people that have been doing this for a long time, they, they carve that mold up to replicate what's going to be the finished size of the ear mold, and then they make a casting out of that, and then from that casting, they do a uh, UV uh, uh, cured acrylic, and it's kind of an interesting process because they basically they take a cast, which is making a cavity, they pour liquid into this cavity, put it in a UV box for a precise timed amount of time, and that forms a shell. It's kind of like the old magic shell that we poured over our ice cream. Yep. That would form the shell. Well, this is kind of doing it in reverse. And so they UV it for a part of time. They pour that out. Then they now have a shell to work with. And then they marry it up with the what we call the faceplate. That's the part that has the battery door and volume control, which has all the electronics attached to it. And then they bore the holes in there for the microphones and speaker to come out and put it all together and then pack it up and we ship it to the customer. And typically, um, you will have them back within uh, two weeks of my receiving uh, your order. It will be back in your ears in two weeks. See, that's amazing. And you could have a two-week turnaround time to have a completely custom product for, for you and your shooting. Or I can I know, know better. We can do it in a day. <laughs> if it wasn't for shooting. <laughs> Well, we we, yeah. we had we had a shooting event in in Orlando, and our lab is actually just in the Orlando suburbs. 
Uh, I took the impressions of, the, of uh, a user, uh, got them to the lab that evening. They delivered them back to the, sh the shooting facility the next day. Brand new set of plugs. So, I mean, it, it, it can be That's done. That's amazing. And, if, and of course, I, I get the calls all the time. I'm leaving, leaving next Wednesday for Argentina. Can I, can I get a set? <laughs> and uh, we, we could do some pretty good things, I mean, as far as getting them out. But the, the, the standard, standard delivery is within two weeks. But that's, I mean, two weeks is still, that is not a bad turnaround time for a custom product. Yep. Um, you know, really, it's just getting, your, getting the molds and then getting them out to you. That's, yep. That's really awesome because... We, we almost spend more time in shipping than we do in production. Well, it, it's funny you talk about shipping. I was having... Um, I, have a, I, have a, I have a package coming in. It came in from Missouri. Um, it was supposed to be delivered yesterday. UPS says I'm going to get it today, but yet it's still in Wyoming. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm like, it's not going to happen. I mean, because you'll get delays in shipping. I mean, it, you're, I mean it takes time. To get product if so if, if your your lab is in florida i'm in montana that's a week right there just and that's if it's good weather right yep well in in and, and, and all my shipments back and forth from the lab are done uh next day air so we don't okay. don't waste any time with that and then my standard shipping to the customer is fedex today awesome. awesome which now, which these days with fedex could be three or four days. <laughs> could be three. Yeah, it, yeah. Every shipping company seems to like not be doing great with their timing right now. Um, well, I mean, we, uh, I mean, I just got the FedEx notice this morning about the storms, you know, going through Memphis last night, uh, to, to dis disrupt them because it, it's not so much the storms itself. Uh, it's the lightning. When they hit the lightning on the ramps, all the personnel have to get off, go. you know, go indoors yep. and that just stops everything. But, uh, yeah, I, I remember that because when I was in college, I I, uh, I loaded trailers for UPS, and um, and yeah, we we would very carefully watch uh, the storms. Not and we weren't in the air operation; we were in the ground. Well, we were the the local sort, so that was all the trucks coming back with the packages in them. Um, but I remember the guys doing the air stuff. They were very they were they watched the uh, they watch weather pretty carefully because. Uh, you know, my facility was in Delaware. Our everything was going up to Philly to ship, um, and we had one customer. It was a bank because you know Delaware, of course, it's a bank. Um, they wanted to run uh, credit card processing as long as they could, and they were just on the edge of uh, Newcastle County Airport. We actually had a Lear jet right there at Newcastle County Airport where we would drive the packages to there and that would take off to go to Philly to make the sort. And we were always watching that that weather because the second that lightning went off, all bets were off. Yep. So, now, Lupo kind of uh, led into this where he was wearing these for his motorcycle. Now, all three of us are shooters. What other... I mean, this is not just a shooting product. This can be used for other industries, right? Oh, it definitely. Um, the we work best with short duration loud noises, impact noises. So I've had a lot of woodworkers use it, uh, a lot of carpenters, okay. where they're using nail guns and they're cutting metal studs. Uh, had an owner of a muffler shop uh, that needed hearing aids, and um, he's back and forth from the shop to the office, the shop to the office. Go to the shop where they're, you know, chiseling off old mufflers. And then he's back in the office trying to talk to customers. He wore them for that. Um, we've we've outfitted dentists are using them uh, because of the noise in their, the their hand pieces, the drills, yep. and stuff like that. Uh, the modern drills, the uh, air turbine ones, are fairly quiet, but it's still the bit hitting the enamel of the tooth that screeches. And uh, it's it's tinnitus is a common malady in dentistry hearing loss and tinnitus uh, because of all that high-pitched noise they deal with. So, yeah, it, it can be used for just about any type of uh, things. Now, I tell people, you know, if you're driving a bulldozer or running a jackhammer all day, no, this isn't the product for you. Uh, because what we technically are doing is the earplug is the protection, whether it's turned on or off. The amplifier then manages how much sound it lets through. So we limit our output of the amplifier to about 90 decibels to keep it safe. 
So if you're out driving a bulldozer all day, you're still going to be listening to 90 decibels, which is yeah. technically, technically too loud on the time-weighted average versus an impact noise. And so, uh, you know, there's certain things that it, it just doesn't work for. You know, you're not going to wear them in a factory eight hours a day. Right. That type thing. It's not, not for that type of thing. It's short duration, loud noises. So that, that's where that comes into play. And with gunfire. Yeah. I was going to say, although, because you have the capabilities of turning them down, and if you are a shooter, if you're in a thing where the noise level is high, you could just wear them and turn them down so you get minimal of that noise. Well, that's minimal of the ambient sound. Yeah. If okay. the ambient sound is, uh, we start managing it at 70 decibels, but I've, I've tried to wear mine to concerts. I get that question all the time. Can I wear them to concerts? Yeah, kind of. I mean, it's going to limit the output to, you know, of Led Zeppelin down to 90 decibels <laughs> uh, when they're playing at 105 or 10, something like that. Uh, but what happens is the amplifier is bringing the ambient noise in, and it's bringing it up to the 90 decibels. So it's it's going to pick up any loud noises and bring it up. Uh, so in the music in the music area, the other thing is we're not designed for those super loud constant sounds. So basically, the system goes into distortion. The microphones can't handle that input level. They're not designed for that. You know, it's that makes uh, sense. you know. So it's it's like you know the microphone that you're using for the podcast. You can't take that out to a NASCAR track and try to hold an interview while no. cars are going by. Because that no. that microphone's not going to handle that that yeah. loud sound. It's going to distort. So it, it's kind of that process. Awesome. Gotcha. Makes sense. Uh, let's see here. Um, it's funny. We, we I was going through my notes because we went through so many things <laughs> just talking there. Um, so. Now you do everything custom fit for the ears. Have you ever thought about maybe doing a set of muffs, or is it just like, hey, that's just not our thing? Um, you know, in the early days when uh, business was lighter, <laughs> um, yes, I looked at, thought about branding a set of uh, uh, muffs for uh, you know ESP muffs, uh, but there's just so many out on the market. That's what they do uh, in dealing in. In the retail store type product, you know, having the SK SKUs and, and all that type of stuff, that's a whole different business model. Uh, sure. It would take up so much time with an investment in stocking, you know, on our end, then getting, you know, a, a pallet out to Bass Pro, uh, you know, and, you know, getting four, four of them out to Joe's Gun Shop. Uh, it, 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 would, it would take a whole different business model. Uh, so I made the conscious effort to, stay uh, focused on the custom area and in the upper end of the hearing protection market. You know, we also right. looked at doing the universal fit ones. Uh, but then again, uh, the, the problems with those in the fit and then talk, talking about other industry players, uh, the return rate on those is very high because well, they don't and, work and for people. <laughs> And that's the thing is your customers, like, like you said, you've been, you know, it, ESP has been around for 20 some years. Yep. The customers are expecting a certain product, right? So yep. like, like we were talking about before, you know, at least the problems I have with these, you know, universal fit ones is, you know, your customers are going to expect that hearing protection all the time. And that thing is going to fit. It's going to stay Whereas if you go into a universal fit, it's just it's just not the same. It, it's not the same product at all. But yet these customers are probably going to expect that, which yes. could could lead to a very low, well, very high return rate or very low satisfaction rate. Yep. I mean, I, I get customers all the time. I bought product X. I brought product Y. I brought product Z. I decided I better do it right and get get your stuff. Because they bought the Universal Fits and they tried this this brand brand A brand Z, you know, and all the issues that you're talking about, you know, fit, wind noise, sound quality, um, you know, they they, you know, they've gone through four or five hundred dollars that could have gone towards our product to begin with. That's funny you say that because I'm sitting there, I'm just looking around the studio here, and I can see 
four <laughs> universal fit products just in the studio here. Um, and you know, like, like what Lupo was saying about your ears getting hot. Like for me, when I go to the range, you know, my wife goes, goes shooting with me. Um, she does not, she does not, you know, she, she doesn't like earmuffs because they get hot. Right. And then, you know, the band going over top of your hat, it usually ends up hitting that button at the top and then pressing in. Yep. It makes a very, mis it makes a very miserable shooting experience for her. When, you know, really the electronic hearing protection started coming out, I got her a pair and that was like a game changer for her. Right. Cause now she doesn't have that, that thing, but yet you have the electronics so we can talk. We're not yelling at each other at the range. And that's where I really like um, about the electronic hearing protection. But again, the consumer grade stuff that I've seen is got problems. I mean, I, I, all these products I'm seeing around me in the, in the studio here, I'm going that one. Um, it worked okay, but then it rubbed on the inside of the ear here. Um, this one has a, you know, it has the cord to go around it, but the cord that they had, they used a braided cord. So every time I turn my head, you hear a zipper sound come through. Um, you know, another one there is a, is a corded one. They didn't have a braided cable. They had a PVC coated cable, but the problem I have with it is that one falls out. Um, <laughs> there are all these problems, right? And that's what I, I think people are getting frustrated with those type of products. That's why, you know, when I started talking to Lupo about his experience with your product, that's why I wanted you on is there's a better product out there. You just need to go you want this better product. Yep. And, and, and in all fairness, you know, the, the universal fit products, um, if your anatomy will accept it properly, there, there's a place for them. I mean, if you've got, right. you know, I mean, how many millions of handguns have we sold in the last two years? Uh, new shooters, you know, that are going to go to the range and spend a half hour to an hour at the range. That's fine for them. I mean, it, you know, it, and they're only going once a month, twice a month, maybe. And for those type of, of scenarios, yeah, they can work for you. Uh, but yeah, if you're going out on a hunt, um, I just got back from the Safari Club convention. And one of, one of the guys I know there has worn, well, I don't know how many years, but years, years ago after he had them for a year and a half, he made a post that he wore them 486 days in a row in the bush all day long. <laughs> Wow. You know, uh, and, and he told me, he, he told me this week, he said, you know, this is why I can still hear my kids because, uh, you know, I wear them all the time. And Wait, is so, that a positive or a negative? Well, it depends on your kids, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say anything about his wife. <laughs> <laughs> That's the funny I'm thing. I'm sorry, you know. the battery, the battery's dead. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, you know, for me, I have hearing loss, right? And, um, you know, I have the tonight. I've had tinnitus since I was a kid. Um, and it, it's funny is that, you know, I go, my wife's like, you can't hear, right? I'm like, I know. And like the TV's always loud and stuff like that. But I go to like a, a, a doctor and they do the hearing test and like, your hearing is perfect. My wife's like, no. Well, the doctor just goes, well, I think he has selective hearing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and like, she's oh, like, you're blowing it for me, man. She's like, I would agree with you, but there are other things that, that has problems. And that, that's the thing I have a problem where, you know, I do a lot of, a lot of videos where I'm testing products. I do some consulting where I'm testing products. Um, one of the, one of the rifles I use is a 16 inch, um, 308. This gun, it's it's a it's an AR with an adjustable gas, and we have it. I have it overgassed. This, if if you have a bad product, this rifle will find it. This this thing will find a weakness in a product because it just beats the hell out of everything, including my hearing. Right? I mean, because it, it's three hundred eight at a sixteen inch barrel. Where we have not burned all the powder. We have. I mean, and it's shooting a muzzle brake, which is. You know, those gases are coming back at me. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where I run into a problem with these universal fit ones. Because I will start shooting. That's what I told you. One popped out in an opportune time. It was on that rifle. M my ears were ringing really bad. Or my ear was ringing really bad after that. Um, 
and that's the thing uh, that I want to, you know, I, I know a lot of, uh, I know a lot of competitive shooters are out there talking about their hearing protection. As they're getting older, it's funny to start hearing them talk about hearing protection where they're getting a little more picky about it because they're admitting they have hearing loss. And now, and, and I look at it, I, I'm 50 and I'm sitting there thinking about the things I could have done 10, 20, 30, you know, I've been shooting for 40 years. You know, what could I have done to try to avoid this? And, um, and that's the thing is, you know, I mean, I look at the technology 40 years ago when I first started, it was awful. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, it wasn't the greatest. Um, I mean, it was better than nothing. I mean, it's better than taking, you know, paper towels and sticking in my ears. Yep. Um, but as I'm getting older, I'm, I am becoming so anal about my hearing protection because now I look at, it, I got, okay, my hear, I have hearing loss. I have another, hopefully 50 years <laughs> that I've got to deal with what I've got because once it's, once it's gone, it's gone. Yep. Yep. Um, and I will tell you, you know, foam earplugs are very good hearing protection. If, if you stuff them in your ears deep enough and properly enough, yep. you know, the foam is a really good product. You know, it's not going to be, and that's where the hunters don't use them because they can't hear. But, yep. you know, using something uh, is better than nothing. But, I mean, I, you know, I, I met uh, Ted Nugent. And Ted will tell you that he is the walking poster boy for hearing protection. Yeah. Because on stage, on stage, he all, always wore an earplug in one ear so he could hear him sing. You know, the old, yep. you know, the old singer you know, plug in their ears so they can hear their own voice. Well, he always yeah. wore an earplug in one ear, but never in the other ear. And he's basically totally deaf in the one ear, but his other ear is still pretty good. Now, he also then, beat that up shooting because he didn't wear it. Yeah, I was going to say, it, but, you, you add this ranch down in Texas where he goes hunting all the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of anecdotal stories about not wearing hearing protection. I, 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 this, this was a sad one. This, and this was 20 years ago or so, but I had a young man call me up one day and said, uh, doesn't hearing protection weaken your ears? Don't you have to toughen them up to loud sounds? No. <laughs> and he was dead serious. I mean, that, um, somewhere along the line, some, somehow, he, you know, he thought that was a reality and yeah, toughening up his loud sounds is going deaf. This is, this is not weightlifting. No. Yeah. Uh, this is not weightlifting at all. Um, yeah, that's that's a that's scary hearing that. Um, yeah. Well, the, the the latest the latest and greatest in the myths of hearing protection is Air, Apple AirPods and now the Google yeah. Pods that have noise cancellation technology. Oh my God! Well, we can <laughs> use this for, for you. We can use this for shooting. Well, the noise, I've got, I've got pixel buds. I love them. The noise cancellation works great on the airplane, but it doesn't have a good enough acoustic seal to the ear for shooting and hunting. So um, at SHOT Show last, not this year, but last year, um, so SHOT Show 2022, um, you know, the, the return of SHOT Show after COVID, uh, at range day, you know, I'm, I'm rolling around and you have the ROs that are at every booth making sure that everybody's safe, that you have hearing protection and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I'm running around with uh, consumer grade, you know, hearing protection, the universals. Uh, I've used them for a while. I like them kind of. Um, actually, I, I like them. I just, they, they could be better. And uh, I remember everybody going, you know, all their ROs going, are those earbuds? I'm like, no, no, it's actual hearing protection. And um, I remember being at one booth, the guy, the guy who actually ran, or one of the guys who that actually was there from the company goes, yeah, I brought my air, I brought my AirPods and I thought that was going to do it for me. I'm like, yeah, how, how'd that work when the first trigger got squeezed? And he goes, yeah, it didn't work very well. I had to go get a pair of foams. Um, and that's the scary thing. I, that, I, I, I hate sounding like an old person, but that's scary thinking about people thinking, you know, earbuds. I mean, 
I'm using uh, Samsung earbuds here just for the podcast so I can hear. Uh, mm -hmm. And I would never take them to the range. There's, there's right. just no way that these are ever going to filter out that much sound. And, 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 and that is purely a mechanical issue. They're not, not designed to go down into the ear canal and seal the ear canal well enough. And, and the fact that they're universal. Uh, you know, they, they have, you know, some rubber tips on them for sizing to get you, a, you know, a better seal, but it's not, it's still into that one size fits all fits nobody category that yep. you're getting close, but it's not enough for shooting. Yeah. Now we've been talking for about 45 minutes. What I want to bring up here, uh, earlier I brought up your webpage where you had the graph of, of the hearing protection, but I want to bring your webpage up here. So we can take a look at the products. Okay. Uh, would you mind walking us through the products here a little bit? Okay. Basically, we, we have four models, um, and they're somewhat built to you know price points as far as that. The protection is the same in all the models because that's in the earplug itself. Um, so the protection is the same across the board. The difference, simplistically, is the quality of sound of the sound reproduction in between gunshots. Um, a simplistic way of describing the difference, it's like going from AM radio to FM to CD to iPod. The better the circuit and better the components, the better it sounds. Awesome. Now, and and like, well, I'm it, looking here, it, they're all custom fit. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, all waterproof, which is important for, uh, you know, being outdoors, right? Because yes. like these consumer grade ones, I know they're not waterproof. Yes. <laughs> Ask me how I know. <laughs> yeah, we have an IP57 rating, uh, which means you can be under a meter of water for 30 minutes. Uh, I can't hold my breath that long, uh, <laughs> but uh, um, they do carry that. Um, you know, I, in, in some respects, uh, I, I hate to call them totally waterproof because the batteries aren't waterproof. Right. They're not part. They're not part of the process, and uh, so you know, if you do get wet, just get the batteries out, <laughs> because they, they have more of a tendency to corrode and cause problems. But as far as the device itself, um, the the product that we use is the same product that Samsung uses to waterproof their phones, and the company sent me samples of the material, and basically what they did is or some demo stuff. They took tissue paper, Kleenex, and treated their product and basically you can take and pour a cup of water over the Kleenex and it just rolls off. Oh, wow. It's pr pretty amazing product. Yeah. And basically once we get our stuff built, uh, we put it into an, it's in, it goes into an ionization chamber. So it's uh, flooded inside and out with the water protection. It's not just a coating on the outside. It's inside and out. The whole, whole mechanism is done. That's awesome because, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, again, we're not submersing them, right? I mean, really, we're out there. We're just trying to protect from some rain, right? Because, yep. I mean, you're outside. We're, you're not, like we said, we're not submersing them. It's not like we're going swimming with these things. Well, people um, do fall into the duck pond. I was thinking that. <laughs> yeah, duck hunters are, are a different breed there, right? Yep. Uh, that, that that does happen. But but the rest, rest of us, we're not out there. We're just trying to... <clears throat> We're just trying not to, you know, not to ruin a piece of electronics as we're shooting before between grabbing our crap up and then getting to the car, yep. you know, or or getting, uh, hopefully it's not lightning, getting under a tree where you can get out of the rain. Um, so that's kind of the the thing is, is these other hearing protections are just not designed for that, um, which which makes me think of, you know, when I do com you know competition shooting. Uh, it, it gets warm in the summertime, even here in Montana, it gets a little warm and it makes me wonder what my sweat's going to do to those things too. Not much, not much. Uh, uh, again, it's, it's the battery issue. Yep. And while we're, you know, while we're talking about that, we, we use a standard hearing aid battery. Hearing aid batteries are air activated. There's a little paper tab on them. And once you pull that tab off, they start cooking. So they're good. They're good for about 300 hours or six weeks, whichever comes first. But the downside to the battery is when it dies, it starts to outgas its, its chemicals and or soak in moisture, humidity, and causes the case to swell and get stuck. 
Uh, and that's something that 10, 10, 15 years ago, we never had battery issues. I mean, unless I had, you know, some duck hunter that put them away wet and left them for a year, uh, never, never had issues with batteries. Now it's a daily, daily thing. And it, it's battery manufacturers did something to their batteries uh, to make them more, more tendency to swell. And I think it's modern manufacturing. They can make the cases, metal cases thinner to put more chemicals in to say we have more power and make them weaker. Yeah, because I know that just from red dots in my pistols and, and rifles, uh, there are, there, you know, and there are bigger batteries. Obviously, there are bigger batteries than hearing yep. aid batteries. But it's so funny. You watch those things. I actually had one in a red dot where the battery actually separated, you know, because you have that, you know, that groove yep. there between the positive and negative. It actually separated. And I'm like, wow, I got this thing out in the right time. Yep. Because um, this, this could have been, disastrous to this red dot yeah uh the other thing that comes up all the time with our products is rechargeable um rechargeable systems have their place but they are not all that reliable in, at least in the hearing aid side of the business uh, the recharging cases go bad the recharging in the unit goes bad the batteries and uh, the, you know the small batteries and for our type of product, if you're out on a three-day hunting trip, how, how are you going to recharge them? Get hot. You know, you got you to carry around a battery pack or, you know, type thing and all that kind of messing around with. So we don't, we don't get into the rechargeables. Well, and hearing aid batteries are not that expensive. I mean, this is not a cost-prohibitive thing. No, at Costco and Sam's Club, they're under a buck a piece. You know, you can get a pack of like 96 of them dirt cheap on Amazon and just have like a huge supply. And because be they're very air careful. Activated. Yeah. Oh, really? Be, be very careful of that. Uh, because of their air activated nature, they have much more of a shelf life than a lead acid battery or, or, you know, lithium battery or something like that. That's good. to so know. the shelf life is only a few years, a couple years, three years, so to speak. Um, I had one gentleman that did that. I don't, I think he might've got him his on eBay. He must've got old stock. He said one out of three batteries worked. You know, so, it's funny you funny you say that because I remember because uh, you know I, I go through batteries with red dots. Uh, I ended up buying a big thing off of Amazon of uh, I mean what are they thir uh, twenty thirty twos, and you know I could power a red dot for about two days off of these things. I'm like, uh, this has got to be some old stock. So I started putting them into like the remote start of my car, like because it took the same same battery. And um, uh, I got two, two months that battery was completely killed in the remote start of my car. Something that rarely gets used. And so, that's something that yeah, usually goes years before you take yeah. a battery. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I, yeah, I was doing... That, I've been, batteries are cheap, so you don't have to really worry about it too much. Well, yeah, but it's... it's uh, do you have the batteries with you? <laughs> you know, yeah, when, yeah. They, when they do go bad. So I, I was doing yeah. some research... And reading reviews and stuff on uh, uh, Amazon sold batteries in some of these uh, really weird names, that, you know, and people were discussing, and it was different batteries for different purposes, but they were saying, yeah, I bought these batteries and the ones I had before from brand name Railvac EverReady type thing that lasted me two years, these ones I didn't even give me three months. And so the cheap comes out expensive. Wow, you know, it's something you just don't think about. Um, yeah, you know, I didn't. I didn't even think about the battery thing. I mean, literally, these batteries had them six months, um, and you know, it was, a, it was a great deal. There's a reason mm -hmm. why it was a great deal. Um, yep. And and I'm learning the hard way of that. Going, I should have just bought the two batteries that I needed. Well, see, the, you know, the um, the the, yeah. the twenty thirty two battery that you mentioned. Uh, you know that's a this, that's a standard size battery, and that relates to the the mechanical design, how tall it is, how big around it is. Yeah. You know, it's the physical size, and whatever voltage it has. But I don't think the standards on battery sizes have anything to do with how much chemicals are actually in there yeah. and how long they'll last. Yep, Jack. So is like there it, a particular brand that you recommend over any other ones that seem to do the best? Um, probably the Railvac Proline 
they, they call them ProLine, uh, is, is one of the best on the market. But uh, basically, the, the Everready, Railvac, and uh, I can't think of the third one now. But the, the ones that you're going to find at Walgreens, CVS, uh, the main, mainstream brands, and you know at, at those locations, they go through enough volume that the stock is fresh. Uh, or you know your local hearing aid place. Uh, Power One is another good brand, uh, as far as that goes. Uh, just don't if they have a, a Chinese name on them. Um, <laughs> you probably want to avoid them. Be, be, be careful. <laughs> yeah, be careful. <laughs> um, and, and and be careful where you're buying them. Like I say, uh, some of the Amazon sellers and some of the eBay sellers that are selling those uh, 500 packs of batteries. It's probably old stock that's been gathered up and they've repackaged to make a deal out of. Yeah. And that's exactly what I think mine were. Um, Cause it's a, it was like a, you know, a card of five of them and you got like 10 cards. And it's just yeah. like, Hey, that's a great deal. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, they're so bad. I won't run them in my red dots cause I'm going to have to go through them. And then, you know, some of my red dots, you got to go to the underside of them to replace the battery. Um, yeah, those are like a Doracel, uh, you know, some a, yep. a name brand in those. Yep. And then I just, like I said, every two months I just replace the battery and the remote start of my car, <laughs> and uh, I, I, that is that is disturbing considering I know that batteries have lasted over two years in that thing. Yep. Um. Now, now it's down to two months. So the key is to stick to name brands and don't buy like Bob's batteries. Yeah. Pretty much. That's pretty simple, yep. And, and and don't do like one gentleman did. He bought two 16 packs of batteries. He didn't want to carry around the card, so he took all the batteries out of the little dial and peeled off all the tabs. Oh, he activated all of them. That's awesome. And six weeks later, he had 16 dead batteries. <laughs> <laughs> that was an expensive lesson. Yep. I'm, you, you surprise people that actually admit to doing stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, it happens. I, I, I guess, you know, every once in a while we admit to the, uh, to our indiscretions, um, yep. uh, loop over there knows probably more of mine than I care that he would ever know about, but, uh, it, it happens now we've been going for, oh gosh, almost, almost about 50 minutes now. Um, 57. How the, 57. <laughs> yeah. So how, uh, how do people get a hold of you? I mean, um, you know, well, First of all, there's the website, ESPAmerica.com. Uh, we got everything on there with all our contact information, product information. Um, if you're going to go to a local audiologist to get your impressions like Mike did when going to Sam's Club, uh, there's an order form process online. It's a form filler. It doesn't, doesn't take your money online. Just fills out the form. Uh, it'll email you a copy, print that out, put it in the box, send your molds in. Uh, you can also reach us at 303 Six five nine eighty eight forty four. That's the phone number, and most of the time I answer unless I'm on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> unless 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 Jason is taking you away from uh, from getting work done. Yeah. Now, for everybody watching or listening, uh, you don't have to worry about writing that stuff down because I'll have it in the description down below. So if you're driving your car or listening along, don't pull out a pen or a pencil and try to write this stuff down. Just come back to the podcast later and click the link. And it'll take you right over. Well, the website is easy. It's ESPAmerica.com. Awesome. And then um, I'm going to have several reviews um, highlighting these uh, these ears because I own both the Apex and the um, the uh, originals. Um, and I'll be doing a comparison between you know the analog version and the Apex. And then I'm also going to be talking about how they compare to other hearing protections. But um, in the description of almost all my videos, well, I have a link to their information in there. Awesome. And then uh, for everybody, I will also have a link in the description to Lupo Outdoors. So that way you can get over to his channel and subscribe. And then make sure that as you do with my channel, ring the bell. So that way you get all the notifications. So when he releases that video, you get a chance to watch it. All right. So now what I like to do is I like to end the podcast with a speed round. So it's going to be four this or that questions and then one thinking question. And we will start off 
with calibers. Would you rather shoot a nine millimeter or a 45? 45. I, I, I like this guy already. <laughs> I mean, it, this, is go, this is going really well. So indoor range or outdoor range? Outdoor. Because at indoor ranges, you have to double up your hearing protection. It's too loud. <laughs> Plus, it's just more fun being outdoors in general. You get the, you, you get the air, and then, and then if, if somebody's shooting that big caliber, you don't have to wait for the air filtration system to pull it away. Um, yep. It just naturally goes away. Exactly. So, steel or paper targets? Um... Well, I have to admit, I've never shot a steel target, so <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm more of a shotgunner. So, uh, although yeah. although I, I was injured by a steel target, I was at gun site at one of their alumni shoots, and and I was a, a observer, and all of a sudden I felt a sting on my chin. Took a piece of shrapnel, piece yeah. of jacket to my chin. That's that, and that is the problem with steel. I, I love shooting steel, um, but yeah, you got to. Uh, well, you should be wearing eye protection anyway, but you really want to make sure you wear eye protection when you're when you're running steel. Like you know, I wear glasses, um, and uh, I make sure that you know I am wearing my actual eye protection, not you know. Don't don't half-ass it with your eye protection because you will get a jacket that comes back, and that is not fun. That is totally not fun. Luckily, mine was fairly minor. It was like a little corner broken off of a razor blade and just a little sting in my chin, pulled it out, and held my finger there, and it dried up. No stitches. All right. So so now, now that I know you're a shotgunner, and Lupo's going to enjoy this because he got hit with this one last week. Um, over, under, or side by side? Single barrel. Single barrel? Semi auto. Semi auto. Oh, oh, there you go. What, uh, what shotgun? Uh, Freda, 391, 392, that series. But I, I, also, I also have the sweetest gun I've ever bought. Was a uh, um, um, uh, it's a it's an over and under twenty eight gauge, um, B Rosini. Wow, uh, a true twenty eight gauge size frame, and I bought that gun to for grouse hunting, and took it out to the clay's course. First time out of the box, shot my average. Nice. Oh, wow. That's it just, awesome. It fit me right. It felt right. It just. <laughs> I don't want to take any of the other ones out now. <laughs> <laughs> it's but, funny how that happens. Yeah, but uh, I was really surprised at how well 28 gauge does. Yeah, my my first shotgun uh, that I shot was my dad's Browning Auto 5. Um, and I was seven when I shot that. It's probably why I have bad shoulders today. Um, just because of... Uh, um, that thing kicked uh, because I'm sure I was not holding that thing as tight as I should. Um, and I still got that shotgun after my dad died. Um, I got it in the safe in the other room. I just love that, that gun. Um, but now um, the gun, the shotgun I take out most is probably uh, my Benelli M2. Um, I just, I love that shotgun. That's just, that's so much fun. Some of the autos are fun. <laughs> I just have to interject that. My shotgun that I use for sporting clays is my Beretta DT10 EELL, which I love that shotgun. So not everybody has 16 grand for a shotgun there, Lupo. And? <laughs> <laughs> no, but that is a gorgeous shotgun. I'm, I'm jealous about that shotgun that you have. Well, I bought it off my first instructor um, uh, at a significant di discount. And... Um, and I still use it today. That's the one I shoot over at uh, a Blackjack Sporting Clays here in Florida. Um, and it's it's just a, a fine, fine shotgun. The, the key to shotgun shooting is finding it, making the shotgun fit you. Yeah. Um, and if, you, if it doesn't fit you, it doesn't matter how good of a shot you are, you're going to have a problem. 
And that's, you know, shotgun technology has changed so much in the stocks. Um, I'm trying to remember, God, I'm trying to remember back when I was in FFL, the one shotgun I sold, uh, I think it was a Winchester, where you have the, you could take the stock off and there's wedges that you can put in to try to change the angle of the stock to try either up or down to try to fit the gun to you. I was like, I, it's kind of cool, but it's, I, I don't know how much, I don't know how much it actually worked you know well it's kind of hard to fit it's kind of hard to fit a shotgun to yourself yeah uh, yeah you, you right need, you need you, you need somebody that knows shotgun fit to analyze your physique your position your facial features neck length yep. and all that to, to decide what fits just because it feels good doesn't mean it fits it's yeah. spot on Jack over, who's my instructor now, who turned me on to ESP um, over at Blackjack. Um, you know, he's sitting there working with my... Now, I've shot this shotgun for years. And he goes, you know, there's something wrong with, with how that's fitted to you. Because my previous instructor fitted the shotgun to me, who I bought the shotgun off of. And he sits there and he goes, I need you to go order this part. Bring it next week, you know, and, and we'll put it on. And it was just a palm pad for the right side. And he sits there and he's sitting there having me hold it up and he puts it on there. And he goes, now hold up the shotgun. I went there, he goes, now you're spot on. And then we went out and shot and I was like, how come I didn't know about this for years later? And he goes, he didn't fit it to you correctly. He goes, it sometimes is, and it was like a $6, you know, uh, sticky pad you know, that fitted into my palm. And I was like, it, it, it was day and night difference in my shooting. Yeah. You can, awesome. you guys with those shotguns. Um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I've got enough, I have enough, uh, invested in my pistols and rifles. Um, but I, you know, I love, I love sporting clays. I love trap. You know, I started shooting trap when I was 10. Um, I love all, I love that stuff. It's just, man, I just it, a shotgun seems it still is an enigma to me today, and I think it's because I just don't go shooting with the right people. And you don't aim a shotgun. No, you point a shotgun. You point a shotgun. Yeah, I, I think honestly, I think that's um, I think that's my biggest problem. Um, like I, uh, my Benelli M2, um, I use that for my my three gun setup, and I have the ghost ring and all that stuff. So it it, it reminds me of shooting a rifle. Um, kind of reminds me of shooting like my M1 Grand, just because of that ghost ring. And um, but yeah, when I get out there and I get shooting sporting clays, uh, I'm usually I'm usually good for twenty five, <laughs> uh, and. Uh, well, Lupo knows this story because uh, uh, on on that uh, on that Browning A5, uh, you know, we were used to going uh, hunting with that thing. So my father had a full choke on it. So going out sporting clays at this one range I used to shoot at, the first half of the range was all close targets. So I was like, you know, I miss because I got that full choke. And then the second half is is your long range ones. And uh, I, I was shooting that. Yeah, you know, I yelled pull, and it, it was the shot. The bird was coming right over top. You know, the pigeon was coming right over top of your head and going out. And then um, I was sitting there, and I was just waiting, 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 waiting. And I think it's just getting farther and farther out. Then finally, I squeeze. Yeah, you know, I squeeze the trigger, and I think just disintegrates in air. Right. And then uh, I come walking back, and and they're like, "What are you shooting?" I go, uh, "Full choke." And they're like, that's why. Uh, like, what? They're like, well, we're trying to figure out how you're missing these really easy shots in the beginning. And then now we're sitting there like, did he not see the pigeon come out? You know, it, it, it's like, are you going to shoot? I mean, this thing's getting like out there. And he goes, I was like, yeah, I was just waiting for that thing to get to my sweet spot. And they're like, yeah. And I go, and they're like, yeah, usually the clay pigeon kind of just breaks. They're like, you're yep. disintegrated in air. And I'm like, yeah, when I think it hits, it hits hard. So, for the last question, now this is your thinking question. 
you walk into a warehouse and in this warehouse has literally one of every gun that has ever existed whether it was a prototype or a production gun or a one-off gun and you could have one of all these just just one which gun would you grab first thing that came to mind is a 1911 Okay, well, I, I kind of figured that with the forty five. Any any particular nineteen eleven come to mind? Um, remember, it's one from every gun that was ever produced. Yeah, I mean, there's so many so many models of nineteen elevens that have been built by so many different manufacturers. Um, I really couldn't pick one. I mean, I've always been partial to the original Colts. There you go. You know, look, okay. like a comp, like a like a combat target or a okay. gold cup. Gold cup, yeah. That's it. gold cups are nice guns. That's what I okay. have. This a gold cup, nineteen eleven, and I love it. They're kind of like this. They're kind of like why well, I'm going to use. They're kind of like the gold standard for nineteen elevens. I mean, those yeah. things are just amazing guns. I mean, um, you know, in you know, if you you start looking now, you know, Wilson Combat uh, Korth. Looked at those Korth guns. Uh, yeah, you know, take out a second mortgage for those. Uh, but that, though, I mean, I mean, they're so well built and they're so, so pretty. But <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Well, it, and that's kind of the thing is um, it, it's funny where people talk about these things. Is for me, I'm a practical pistol shooter. Okay, uh, and what that really means is that I need you know for competition, I need the gun to go off. I need to go off every time. I need to be reliable. And I've seen so many people show up and they're, you know, they're like, I've got, I've got this Kimber and I'm sitting there going, awesome, man. You're going to be cleaning that gun halfway through. And, and I love, don't get me wrong. I love Kimber. I can appreciate their tight tolerance and stuff into it. You know, the, the craftsmanship they put into their guns, but being a practical pistol shooter, I know that thing gets dirty. It's going to jam. Um, and you get into some of these really high end guns, they, you know, they're they're awesome. Um, but I wouldn't a lot of them I wouldn't take because I I have that whole practical thing going through my head of if it gets dirty, I know it's not gonna I, I know it's gonna jam on me. Corvette versus cool. Ferrari. Yeah, exactly. A Corvette yeah. you can drive cross country. You're probably not gonna drive do a cross country drive in a in a Ferrari. No. Or a Lamborghini. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. But but that Corvette is plenty fast enough. That's and it's plenty plush enough and yeah, it's pra- yep. it it's it's the the the, the cold 1911 versus the super tricked out speed racer. Race so fine yeah, tuned, so fine tuned that yeah. yeah, you like you say if it gets dirty, it's not running anymore. Or or if you're just not running a hand load that you've yep. custom built that hand load to that gun, it's just not going to run. Um, you know, I've got, Luca's probably sick of here at the C&Ds. Um, I love 1911s. Uh, this has been, this has been one I've been working on for a few years now because I've just never finished it. I built my share of 1911s. Um, you can do a lot of things. People don't realize the, the, the type of craftsmanship that you can do to these things and still make them reliable. Yep. And that's the trick. So. Awesome. Uh, you know, Jack, thank you so much for taking time out to talk to us today. And, and Lupo, man, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me today because it was great having someone on the podcast that, that actually went through the molding process and is using these products. Yeah, um, all I can say is a fantastic product. Which is going to blow my, my review that I'm going to do. <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, watch the review anyhow um the process is easy uh it's worth every penny where i mean it's like this is the last thing you're gonna have to buy for hearing protection it, it's like i can't even describe the day and night change it is from where i will never wear earmuffs again or foam in the ear things as long as i have them and i have the batteries this is all i'll ever use Awesome. Don't get rid of the earmuffs. If you go to an indoor range, double up. That's a good point. 
it's it's funny because um, I remember as a kid, my sister would double up, and we were outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> she still double up, and you know what? She can hear. <laughs> well, one of the, one of these, I mean, final thoughts is uh, down south, uh, Texas, Oklahoma. A lot of their rifle ranges are built with roofs over the top to keep, to keep yeah. the sun off. Reflected sound off those roofs can, especially with muzzle brakes, can be a problem. Yeah. Well, um, so it's environmental. It's you know, it depends where you're at and where you're shooting on what you need to use for protection. See, I'm glad you brought that up because I was just, it, as soon as you brought that up, I'm thinking range day at shot. So, you know, shots down in um, in Nevada, you know, just outside of uh, Vegas there. And, you know, it, it's fine, all the pistol bays, right? You get down farther down some of the some of the 100-yard rifle bays, um, you know, where there's, you're shooting some of the rifles. It's not that big a deal because you're in a, you know, a little tent. Um but when you go up the hill, and that's where all the long-range rifles are, I will tell you, my head, uh, my head hurt, and my ears were ringing. Um, and I was using what was considered a good set of electronic, um, you know, universal earmuffs. Yeah. Uh, not earmuffs, but ear thing. But man, I could, I just couldn't take it anymore. Um, my ears, I got done. My ears, my ears hurt. And I'm like, but I've got hearing protection on and that's what it is you get a couple of those rifles going you get those those bay because you're shooting you know if i'm standing that that thing is only uh, you guys can't see on the video it's only about two feet above my head and it's slanted and that sound is coming right back to the shooter yep yep and indoors so, it's all amplified by yeah. 10 or 20 so <laughs> Your normal protection, like you said, double up is a great idea. I hadn't even thought of that. Now I'm like, oh, he's going to double up. But, you, you know, when you're inside, that sound just starts bouncing all over the plows. And then you have like five or six more people shooting simultaneously. Well, I mean, if you think about it, an indoor range is not designed for sound abatement. It's designed to keep a bullet within the building, you know. Um, some ranges, and some ranges now are doing acoustic modifications to try to minimize that. That's awesome. But it's the new yeah. modern high tech ranges. Yeah, it's got to it, be. But that that's you got to be helps. new ones. Yeah, yeah. it helps. <laughs> yeah. So awesome! Hey guys, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedules today to join me. Oh, well, thank you. Jack is a really great guy. I enjoyed talking to him, and it was great to have Lupo on there as well, man. Just having that team to talk to and hear about experiences and seeing what happened at the end user side that flowed through to the manufacturing side was really amazing. Something we just do not get on podcasts. Now, definitely take hearing protection seriously. You know, in that podcast, I was talking about hearing and hearing loss. And trust me, like right now, I can hear the, the ringing in my ears. I've done so much damage to my hearing and um, it's something that, you know, like I said on the podcast, once it's gone, it's gone and I've lost hearing. It's really annoying. It's so hard when you have to say, what, what would you, say? I'm sorry. I just can't understand what you're saying. It's kind of, kind of embarrassing sometimes, right? I mean, especially for me where during my day job, I talk to people and, um, you know, I got to listen and I've got to understand what they're talking about. And sometimes I just need to have them repeat stuff. And I feel bad about that. Take hearing protection seriously. Get a good set of hearing protection to go to the range. Jack's got a great lineup of hearing protection. And guys, it's not cheap. But you are talking about something that, you know, once it's gone, it's gone. Don't screw around. Get good hearing protection. Now for the product of the podcast, it is the Matador Regulator. Now this is a muzzle brake. This one is for 308. And I absolutely love this thing because it is selectable. All right. So you can have it on, off, somewhere in between and take this cap off. And it just disassembles really easy for cleaning. What's great about this is that you can kind of select the amount of braking you're going to have 
or turn it completely off because let's face it, if you're shooting in an indoor range, you're shooting a muzzle brake, you can make a lot of people mad at you really quick. So go check this thing out. I have a video on it on the channel. It's amazing. Now, for those of you on YouTube, click that video right there. It is about how to choose a foregrip for your AR. Thanks for listening. Hope you're staying safe out there and look forward to talking to you again soon.